Would you go as far as saying, for example, if we wait uh, some billions of years, we will see further out in the universe that the existence of these fine tunings means that it's, we would predict that we would see that the universe doesn't end after what could possibly just stop. Well, I mean, of course, there's all, always the possibility. Yeah, no yeah, I mean, one possibility is the universe is simply closed, of course. Mm -hmm. And if the universe is closed, it means if we wait long enough, we will see to the edge of the universe. We will see all the way around the universe. And, um, but of course, if you invoke something like inflation, even if the universe is closed, and it can be closed in inflation, it might be closed on a scale of 10 to the 30 light years or something, in which case we will have a long wait. And actually the key point about the, the, the inflating cosmological model is that you actually do have a, a limit beyond which you can never see. So you never do see, you know, if, you, if you're inflating with a, with a fixed value lambda, there is a horizon beyond which you never see the whole universe anyway. But it's certainly true that um, in principle you, you might be able to see I mean, the, f the trouble is that in inflation itself, your observations are, I think, always going to be confined to the, your own particular bubble. Mm -hmm. Because remember, our observable universe is still only a small patch of one bubble. Mm -hmm. And if you wait longer, you will see more of the bubble. But I don't think there's any way you ever see beyond our bubble into the next bubble. On the other hand, there might be indirect ways. People talked about collisions of bubbles and making scars in the microwave background. But at the moment, at least, I don't, I don't think it's... It's, I don't think we would ever be able to see the other bubbles. And that's, of course, one of the criticisms of the multiverse scenario, that it, maybe it's not detected. You know, Wouldn't you we see them if they collide with ours? Well, it's true that one of the ways you might observe and get evidence for this mm -hmm. is to say that in the early universe, these bubbles collided. And then people said, well, in that case, on the microwave background, which, of course, has got these n little, nice little ripples, which are the origin of structure, you would see some scars, if you like, or some signature of the bubble collisions. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, people are looking for that, and there's no evidence at the moment for these, for these scars, for these signatures of bubble collisions. But at least in principle, you can look for them, and I think that's the important thing. And people do simulations to try and understand what, what, what signature you should be looking for. Now, you've... Um mentioned uh, in several of your papers metacosmology right which uh, is this what you're, we're talking about here is it meta or is it well yes i should explain the term metacosmology Please. perhaps it, it seems to me that when you're looking at the frontiers of physics either on the large scale or on the on the small scale in some sense you're always dealing with ideas which are on the border of physics and metaphysics. I mean, the border of metaphysics in the sense that you don't yet have the empirical data to confirm the idea. In other words, the theory, it goes beyond the data. Right, for example, these collisions. Right? And such as that, well, that would be an example of if they, it, we might, in principle, have a, right. evidence. So that wouldn't be meta. Well, the point is, once you get the evidence, it would become, <coughs> it would become cosmology. But, so, but the point is that I, I see this in a historical framework in which the whole history of cosmology is sen essentially one in which the border between cosmology and metacosmology constantly evolves. So if you go back a hundred years, people used to dismiss the whole field of cosmology as philosophy, you know, before we had the evidence for the, the Big Bang and things like that. It was just philosophical speculation. And it was perfectly logical and mathematically logical to consider it. I mean, of course, Einstein, once Einstein's general relativity came along, one could certainly talk rigorously about mathematical models, but there was no evidence for, for those models. And so at that stage, you would say, well, it's, it's mathematical speculation, but there's no evidence for it, and therefore it should be regarded as somewhere on the verge, border of philosophy and, and, and physics. And because until you have the direct evidence for the Big Bang, it remains philosophy, well, it becomes rather philosophical rather than, or even theological, heaven forbid, rather than physics. But then once you get the evidence, because once you get the evidence for the expansion of the universe in, in the 1920s, and then you get the evidence for the hot big the background radiation in the 1960s, and then you get the evidence for the expansion, the acceleration of the universe in the 1990s, gradually what was started off as 
pure speculation, mathematical speculation, becomes part of physics because you actually are getting the data. And of course, the wonderful demonstration of that was the discovery of the microwave background fluctuations and how they had the beautiful, the spectrum of fluctuations was just what was predicted. By. Does it always be, uh, these meta ideas, do they always become physics? Wouldn't you say that the steady state universe once was meta and is now dust? Well, uh, absolutely. I mean, the whole point about something being metacosmology is you don't know whether it's it's going to turn into proper physics, uh, but and there is a, but there is a distinction between whether something is true and whether it's it counts as physics because something something could be true but not be physics. Really, what is? The, I mean, if it turns out that there is never any evidence for the multiverse, mm -hmm. you could argue that it will never be in the domain of proper physics, even though it might be the correct explanation for the fine tuning. So I would take the view that something could be could conceivably be true, but it doesn't in some sense qualify as proper science. That depends on your definition of science. Likewise, something could be, in some sense, qualify as proper physics, in the sense that it's, it's, it's a discussion which would take place among physicists, but might turn out to be wrong. So something like steady state cosmology, you could argue that um, it, it was, of course, originally, if you like, metacosmology, but that once you started getting the data, to confront it you know, with, with so, you know, number counts and radio galaxies and microwave background, then of course that precisely because you could make that confrontation, it meant it was part of physics or part of cosmology. Now of course, it turned out the evidence went against it. But the point is, it, it, had, be, it had made the transition, I would say, from metacosmology to cosmology before it then got basically disproved by the data. So I'm, I, I'm making a distinction between what is true and what... Cosmology in the true. sense it was possible to test it. Yes, absolutely. So, so I'm not saying metacosmology is those ideas which turn out to be wrong. I'm just saying metacosmology are those ideas which, which could turn out to be right and mm -hmm. could turn out to be testable, but aren't, don't qualify as physics or, if you like, mainstream physical cosmology right now. But the point I'm making is that the boundary between cosmology and metacosmology is always evolving. So that yesterday, what was metacosmology yesterday is cosmology today. And what, what is metacosmology today can be cosmology to, tomorrow. And, and when we talk about the multiverse, this is an example of something which I call metacosmology because it potentially can become cosmology, but until we have the actual data that these other universes really exist in some sense, uh, it, it, it doesn't have perhaps the sort of status of other ideas in physics. Now, I, I'm only saying that because I heard many arguments from people like George Ellis who take the view that the multiverse doesn't count as, as, as science. It's really in the domain of philosophy. That doesn't mean it's wrong. It just means it, it can't be investigated in the normal scientific Wait, so, so I see, what, when, I, when I say something's metacosmology, I'm not being disparaging, mm -hmm. because I, I, I guess I half think of myself as a metacosmologist. I'm, I'm interested on the border of physics and philosophy, and, uh, but I'm, I'm just saying that it's, it's a sort of, it's a state of um, purgatory, if you like, between false mainstream cosmology mm -hmm. as part of physics and ideas which are sort of more speculative mm -hmm. um, cosmology or which is on the border of philosophy. But we mustn't forget that you know, most ideas also start off being speculative and in some sense coming from philosophy. Indeed, the whole of science ultimately started with, um, evolved out of natural science. So I've always thought there's a, a, a natural link between physics and uh, metaphysics in some sense, and I, I think it's a shame when sometimes people are too disparaging about philosophy as though it's sort of, you know, it's wishy-washy. I, it's, it's, I think there is a natural symbiotic relationship between physics and, and metaphysics in some sense. Well, have these ideas, as far as you know, changed philosophy of uh, science? That is, uh, the ideas of multiverses, of fine-tunings, and so forth. I mean, here we have a group of people that at least in the, the basic are trying to understand uh, what physical theory is, is in general terms, right? That is, what does it, uh, what's the nature of prediction? What is a theory? Uh, 
and so forth. Have these ideas percolated back into astronomy? As, I mean, to, into philosophy? As yeah, yeah, I, I certainly think they've affected philosophy, uh, yeah. philosophy of science, I should say, yeah. because, I mean, there are quite a lot of eminent philosophers, right. uh, including people in this, right here, in this, right. in this program, mm -hmm. who, who have thought about the implications of fine-tuning for, mm -hmm. for philosophy and the philosophy of science in general. If you ask whether the philosophers have fed back and helped cosmology, I mean, that's maybe, uh, uh, that's a bit harder to say. And in some sense, uh, um, it, it, it depends what you mean by help the cosmologists. But, uh, but, but I don't want to, it, to sound, it's one-sided that we help the philosophers and they don't help us. I do think it's a two-way exchange. But, but, uh, but I suppose the point is that the, the philosophy of science is of interest in its own right, independent of whether it actually helps science. I don't think the purpose of philosophy of science is necessary to help science. So we're not actually necessarily expecting the philosophers of science to help us with our actual cosmological ideas per se, but it's just putting the development of our cosmological ideas in, in, a, in a broader context. In fact, I've found talking to cosmology, philosophers by and large, I find a lot of philosophers are rather skeptical about fine-tuning. Not the ones that uh, the, these coincidences exist, surely not, right? Well, uh, it's skeptical about how se you can have skepticism about whether they really, the coincidences really are um, as big as a coincidence as you think they are. I mean, I, I tend to argue that there's so many of these coincidences and there's such a fine tuning that there really is something strange going on there. You know, I can't give you a precise figure. Of, but whether it's one in a thousand or one in a million or one in a billion, but I would say there is something here which has got to be explained. And the skeptics might say, well, no, it's all a coincidence. But also other skeptics will say, well, it doesn't explain anything anyway. It's all a tautology. We're here because we're here. And actually, I, I disagree with that view. But you, when you get into discussion with philosophers about and the anthropic principle, quite a number of them seem to be wedded to the idea that really it's all a tautology and isn't interesting. And that's what I find very, uh, uh, well, a misrepresentation. Because whatever is, whatever is your explanation of these fine tunings, there is something to explain. And it's not just a question of saying, we're here because we're here. What is surprising is the, de the degree to which you saying you can infer from the fact we are here that the universe has to be the way it is. On larger scales or? Oh, on, well, in terms of the value to the constants and how large it is. And well, for example, there's um, some kind of coincidence that people talk about that the cosmological constant has the value just so that um, uh, we start significantly to inflate right, uh, right now when, uh, when uh, the universe is harboring at least human life. And you've argued that uh, that's a relatively narrow, uh, narrow band because the stars will die out for a while. Is that a coincidence that needs explaining or is that just a coincidence? Well, I mean, as we were saying before, I mean, the Weinberg argument is an argument which says lambda can't be too large. Mm -hmm. But then the question is, well, could it have been much smaller? Why does it have to be, why did it have to be zero at all? Mm -hmm. And in the old days when we used to think about the, the fine tuning, it was actually, I mean, when I wrote the paper with Martin Rees way back in 1979, mm -hmm. it was more or less assumed that lambda was zero because that was at the time the current view that lambda was zero. And then we got questions about, well, you have to fine tune the density parameter and things like that. If the density is too high, the universe recollapses too soon. If it's too low, we don't make galaxies. But the point is, therefore, what, what is interesting to me is, well, does lambda, why isn't lambda zero? Could, could the universe exist if lambda was actually zero? Now, in the arguments, which traditional arguments, there was nothing requiring lambda to be zero. In other words, not to be... Uh, non-zero. In other words, if you had a model where lambda was zero now, I'm not aware of any argument which says that life couldn't arise. But what's interesting is that you then relate it to the value of lambda in the early universe. Mm -hmm. And that people can argue, well, we do need a lambda in the early universe to have inflation, because then inflation is then what's giving you these bubbles, which is giving you this scope to have different values. So that's an argument for saying you do need a lambda 
the early universe. But a different kind of lambda, probably. A different kind of lambda. Well, it's the lambda in the early universe. It's saying you need a lambda in the early universe because this is what gives you the basic bubbles with all the range of the constants. So that's good. But the question is, I can't see any obvious reason why you need a lambda today. On the other hand, if you have a theory which says, well, actually, the lambda in the early universe is somehow related to the lambda today. I mean, obviously, they're not the same values because most of the lambda in the early universe went away when you had reheating. But if you have some sort of theory which says that, well, the lambda we see today is in some sense a residue of the lambda which drove inflation, that would be an argument for saying that, yes, you do need a non-zero lambda. So that's not an argument which was given at the time, but I think it's an argument you might give now because I can't otherwise see any natural reason for saying lambda has to be non-zero. Yes, but we have data, right? I mean, well, we now have, we know. you'd have trouble with the age. Absolutely. I mean, but I mean, the, but it's true. Lambda does enable you to, you know, you can, you sometimes invoke, the people used to invoke lambdas and make the age of the universe longer than the age of the stars and things like that. So there are empirical reasons why we want a lambda. But, but no, there's no doubt that we do need a lambda. But the question is whether a priori we could have had a model purely on anthropic arguments, which, which could have had lambda zero. And I, I might be wrong, but I don't, I'm not aware of any argument which now says we need a lambda for purely anthropic reasons. We do need a lambda empirically, but I'm not a re aware of a, of a, in other words, a lower limit on, on, on lambda um, from anthropic arguments, unless you say that we need a lambda in the early universe and maybe today's lambda is a small residue of that. I like to think that the lambda today is, in some sense, going to be related to the lambda which we had at early times, even though we don't, we don't know that for sure. No, we don't see much evidence for it, I would have said. Well, it's just a question of having theories. I mean, there are theories which relate sure. the lambda at the early time to the lambda now, because, I mean, the point is, in the standard picture of inflation, you know, you roll down the inflationary potential and it, and it goes to zero and reheats, but nobody knows why it actually goes to zero. I mean, it might just go to a very, very small value, which later on, that lambda then, be, of course, is negligible for a long time, and then at some point, lambda becomes significant again. So that's my personal yeah, view. Yeah, those theories will predict a change, though, that you're Exactly. There has to be a big change, and the question is, does, why, when you have reheating, is there a residual lambda, a tiny residual lambda, which many tend to the Ten year later, it comes back and, and uh, makes the universe accelerate again. And I have to say, there are all sorts of other models for sort of, you know this quintessence and things like that. And so it's not so. This is the only explanation. But it's it's the I like it as an explanation because it, it it's it's one reason why you could say there should be a lambda today, if the original lambda didn't get entirely pushed to zero. So in Thrapic, we have a certain amount of data about the universe, uh, you know, data about Bernard Carr, right, which I know how to describe, and, and Oxford, other places. And we also have data on much larger scales, of course. So uh, anthropic arguments are essentially assuming part of that data. Where do you draw the boundary between uh, the data, for example, in scale, uh, or what you mean by life, or could it be that uh, that clock on the wall is important for them? Actually, to me, the whole point about the anthropic principle is that it links all scales. It I mean, let, link all scales. It, or, I mean, let me give you an example. The smallest scale we're aware of is the Planck scale. Mm -hmm. The larger scale we can see is the, the horizon scale. So. The Planck scale is 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. The horizon scale is roughly 10 to the 27 centimeters. So the, that spans 60 decades of scale. Mm -hmm. Now, if you look at all the other things that exist in the universe, first of all, we as human beings, we're roughly midway between them. We're roughly the geometric mean of, of the smallest of the largest scale. That's, that's not a coincidence. That can be understood from straightforward physics. And all the other things like planets and stars and galaxies and clusters of galaxies and on smaller scales things like atoms and protons all of these are intermediate steps between the very large and the very very small but you could ask the question what determines that range why is it 60 decades of scale mm -hmm. now 
That 60 can be understood in a very simple way. You remember I talked about the gravitational fine structure constant, which is actually 10 to the minus 40, this mm -hmm. d tiny dimensionless number describing the strength of gravity. Well, it turns out that the relationship between the Planck scale and the scale of the observable universe is actually, it's alpha g to the minus 3 tooths power. Okay, that's simple physics. And what that is, is 10 to the 60. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it turns out that the, I mean, it's not obvious, but you can show that, that the, and the number of decades of scale from the Planck scale to the scale of the observer universe is 10 to the 60, because that is precisely the 3 tooth power of the fine structure constant. But now, if the fine structure constant were different, you could ask, well, why is it alpha g as small as 10 to the minus 40? Why is gravity so weak? If it was stronger, if instead of being 10 to the minus 40, it was, say, 10 to the minus 20, then the number of decades of scale from the Planck scale to the size of the observable universe would be much, much less. It would be 10 to the 30 instead of 10 to the 60. Stars, because stars have a simple, there's an expression for the mass of a, of a star, which is actually, again, the three, it's the half power. The size of a star is the half power of the gravitational fine structure constant in terms of the size of an atom or something like that. The stars would then also shrink. So, so everything would change. But the point I'm making is that physics beautifully explains all those structures that exist from the smallest to the largest scale. What it doesn't explain is what determines that 60 decades. Mm -hmm. And what determines the 60 decades is alpha g. Mm -hmm. Okay, the fact that it's 10 to the minus, it's precisely the smallest of alpha g, which means we have this huge range of scales, which allows us this huge range of, of structures in the universe. So what I'm saying is that it's precisely that anthropic tuning of alpha g, which is what allows this huge range of scales, which is linking the very large and the very small. So, I mean, uh, this is triggered because you originally asked the question, what is the range of scales in some sense on which right. we, we observe and apply anthropic reasoning? I would say that the range of, the, the sort of mundane range of scales associated with human beings, on the planet Earth, if you like, is, is just, you know, that's somewhere in, in the middle. I mean, it's a small range of scales. And the whole point about the anthropic reasoning is that it connects everything. It connects them from the very largest to the very small. But if we wait much longer, billions and millions of years, will anthropic reasoning change because we'll see larger Well, it scales? is true. If you wait much longer, the uh, horizon size gets bigger, so it's no longer 60 decades of scale. But don't forget the Dickey argument. Right. The Dickey argument well, says, well, actually the Dickey argument basically says the age of the universe has to be something like alpha g to the minus one times the Planck time. I mean, that's simply what the, the Dickey argument comes down to in terms of the the, the main sequence time of a star. It's not obvious, but it turns out to be the age of the universe is roughly alpha g to the minus one times the Planck, Planck time. And that comes out again out of straight physics. So, so your question, if you wait long enough, it's true that this 60 decades of scale argument won't work. On the other hand, according to Dickey, we won't be there. We won't be there. So again, it's, so that your question is very interesting because it actually I think it could be wrong. I mean, you know, maybe we, we will exist long after stars have, have died out, and then you'll have to revise what the anthropic right. argument you is. But I won't exist, but some... There might be some form of... Um, some form of... Um, it doesn't I look promising. <laughs> Cold, dark... Mm. No, but you know, I think Freeman Dyson argued that life could, in principle, go on forever. I mean, now we're living in an accelerating universe, we do have to face the prospect uh, it may be a good or a, a, a pleasant or unpleasant, that we go on forever, that the universe goes on forever, and therefore we may, in some sense, be able to go on forever if we can think of some way of life continuing.